Welcome to the online service of Harborsite Baptist Church, a place of safety, rest, and resupply. We now join the morning service already in progress. Amen. Thank you for singing so well. And I'm certainly glad to have my father-in-law back before you, bouncing the basketball, as it were. When I was in school to become a preacher, well, when I was a preacher boy, um, that's one of those classes that we had to go through. We had to go through evangelist. Well, it wasn't evangelistic song leading. That was a different one. We just had to go through um, song leading. And um, Dr. Dwight Gustafson was the instructor and uh, he was a very tall man. He's about six five, and and uh, not very. I mean, he was about this big around. And very, when he would direct the services at Bob Jones of several thousand people, of course, and he was he was very stiff. And I, I often wondered uh, because periodically we would hear um, he would have a special service or something like that, and he would sing had a beautiful voice, but you never heard it when we had services because he would, he, you might hear the first verse or the first, first word actually of a, uh, of the song. And then he would lip sync the whole thing. And, uh, we had to take this class and periodically he would pick, well, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, he would pick, you know, come up here and lead us. And he would pick the song. So you never knew what you were, what, how were you, what song and how, and you were going to lead and that kind of thing. Of course, there were all, you know, several hundred preacher boys in the class and whatnot. And, and, um, it kind of as an introductory, uh, to this, to this class, he said, how many of you can bounce a basketball? How many, let me see your hands. How many of you can bounce a basketball? Can okay, I know there's more than four or five of you that can do that. Okay. All right. He said, fellas, he said, I know it's, it's, it's kind of intimidating to stand in front of people and have to deal with the music and so on. He said, but if you can bounce a basketball, you can lead music. And uh, I was listening to the radio on the way over here, uh, one of the Christian stations, and they were, they were, it was just a, um, an organ actually, it was playing a song and I was bouncing my basketball in the, you know, people go by, you know, when you're doing that driving down the road, you know, people will look at you kind of weird, but um, I'm glad to have my father-in-law uh, able to do that, and I uh, trust you'll continue to pray for him as he's um, well on his recovery uh, from uh, the heart attack and all of that, and uh, continue to pray for him. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 26, and I want you to hold your fingers there. And then I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I want to read verses 15 through 18, the first part of verse 18. And then we'll get into Acts chapter 26. Ephesians 1, 15 says, Wherefore, Paul is speaking, he says, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. And notice that phrase there in verse 18 again. He says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now, after his conversion, the Apostle Paul, as you are familiar, if you read through uh, the New Testament, Acts in particular, um, traveled far and wide, making converts to Christianity. He saw a lot of people saved, uh, and he planted a lot of churches. And one place that he traveled and one church that he planted was in Ephesus. This particular letter is to that particular local body of believers. 
Now, in his letter, it contains a prayer. We've read part of it. You can read down through the rest of the chapter in chapter one, down through verse 23, and get the rest of the prayer. But this particular passage of scripture from verses 15 to 23 is a prayer of the Apostle Paul. And one of the things that he prays, as we've read in verse number 18, he says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. The word there in the Greek actually means the eyes of your heart, that the eyes of your heart would be open and that and he's writing to the Ephesian believers that they would see things spiritual, okay? Now, when we think of seeing things spiritual, what do we think of? Well, <clears throat> maybe it is that you think of, if you like spooky movies, you know, ghost like movies and stuff like that people see spiritual kind of things in them all the time right uh, they see stuff uh, that's not what we're talking about what we're talking about is those spiritual things that are mentioned in scripture those things that deal with our spirit uh, that um, our soul our spirit our body all you know we're all together in that that particular makeup but our spirit needs to know certain things. We need to see certain things. How many of you have ever, um, maybe it is that you struggle to understand or learn a particular topic in school? You ever have that happen? What kind of things do people, do students even today struggle with understanding? Uh, it might be it might be science. It might be mathematics. It might be grammar. You know why why is it that we should be able in the in in our English speaking America to diagram a sentence? What difference does it make? That's what was going through my mind when I was in English and we were diagramming sentences. That's what went through my mind again when we were in Greek class. There's another more difficult dynamic there, right, of do doing the same thing. And sometimes if you struggle with it long enough, you finally kind of come to a conclusion, a couple different things. This is beyond me. Or maybe it could be, I got it. It's the I got it part that the Apostle Paul is talking about that the eyes of their heart, their understanding, their spirit be enlightened or be able to see. And this is similar to what Jesus said to Paul uh, as he began to instruct Paul into what his ministry would be. Go to Acts chapter 26. And I want to begin reading in verse number 12. down through verse 20, and then I'll pray. Remember that phrase, that the eyes of your understanding or the eyes of your heart be enlightened or open so you can see, okay? Notice verse number 12 of Acts 26. The apostle Paul is giving another account of his conversion he says, whereupon as I went to Damascus, why was he going to Damascus? A little history lesson. Why was he going to Damascus? Why was Paul, he was Saul, why was he going to Damascus? You remember from Acts chapter 7 and 8 with the martyrdom of Stephen, the persecution of the early first, and the first century church and so forth, the fact that who was one of the number one persecutors of the early church at that time? a man named Saul of Tarsus. He became Paul, the apostle. It says, whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commissioned from the chief priests at midday, and he's speaking, speaking to King Agrippa in one of those um, mock trials, if you want to call it that, on his way to Rome, where he would eventually be martyred. But at midday, he says in verse 13 of Acts 26, I saw in the way a light from heaven, 
above the brightness of the sun, shining right round about me and them which journeyed with me. And we were all, and when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things which in, in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works me. For repentance. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to look in your word now, and we would pray that you would help us to see your message, see what you want us to see, help us to hear what you want us to hear, help us not to just gain a heart knowledge of it or a head knowledge of it, Lord, but also to do what we're told. We know that the Apostle Paul did that, we know from scripture and from the fact that he wrote the majority of our New Testament that one of his goals when he wrote to churches and people was that they would see things spiritually, see those things that are important. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to do the same. Open our eyes that we might see, as the psalmist says, wonderful things from thy law. Help us to apply them. It's one thing to understand and to, to know what God would want us to do. It's a completely additional, different thing to do as we're told. We sang, sang some songs about following the Lord, and we pray that you would help us to truly do that, not just to sing it and, and affirm it with our lips, but also, and more importantly, Lord, to do it in real life. Help us to continue to see things from your word, to see your grace and your mercy and your power in our lives and in the lives of others. We pray for the children that their time would be profitable. We pray for ourselves that you would remove any of the distractions that have come our way. Help us to focus our attention upon your word, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to preach a message to you that I have simply entitled, Help Me to See. That's what I want us to, to do. Well, I'm not saying that anybody's not doing that, but we certainly need to see more of what the Lord is doing in our lives. And, and the Apostle Paul, was when he was converted, he was also commissioned, as we've just read, his testimony of it, and of course, what the Lord told him. But he was com converted and commissioned to help other people see. How many of you ever said, that? oh, now I, I see that now? We've all done that, right? Uh, it's an interesting, when we, when we talk about circumstances like that in instances when we finally see it, we finally get it, what do we call it? What do we say? The, the, what, came, what just came on? The light just came on. I saw it, okay? Scripturally, there's an interesting word. Actually, it's in English. It's translated straight from the Greek to English. It is the word eureka. Okay? And you know how you spell it? Eureka. What does that mean? That means I got it. I saw it. I found it. Okay? And that's the, what's going on here in Acts, as Paul is re also refers to it in Ephesians, that people see, that people come to understand these spiritual things going on around them and don't just do those things or don't just hear those things and know those things, but do those things. And I want us to think about, and I want us to ask the Lord to help us see, firstly, my purpose. 
What is your purpose in life? Why are you here? Regardless of whether you're a teenager, and we have some with us here this morning, which is a blessing, okay? We have, of course, a lot of adults here, various ages and so on. And we all sometimes, and you know, we think about uh, when you're talking to somebody about their salvation, maybe one of those questions you have to answer for them is, what's life all about? Why am I even here? Well, God created you for a purpose and a reason. If you look at Acts 26 and verse number 16, Jesus says, arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, for this reason. Now, notice what he says. To make thee a minister. And you might say, okay, pastor, that, that leaves me out because I am never going to be in vocational ministry. I'm not going to be a pastor. I'm not going to be an evangelist. I'm not going to stand up pulpit somewhere, so forth and so on. I'm sorry to have to tell you that is not what he's referring to, all right? The word minister here is, is a subordinate servant who waits to accomplish the commands of his superior. Now, answer this question for me. Who is our su superior spiritually speaking who is it who is it somebody tell me it's the lord okay so if we are going to see our purpose what are we have going to have to come to understand what do we need to see about that purpose well first thing we need to see is that uh, i'm sorry to have to tell you you're not in charge That just ruined the whole thing, right? Because we like to be in charge, don't we? We like to be in charge of our stuff and our thing and our life and so forth and so on. Well, your purpose actually is to subordinate yourself underneath a superior. And you've already mentioned who that superior is. That is the Lord. Now, my question to you is this. Do you see that? Do you understand that? Are you doing that? See, that's part of the problem, I think, when it comes to living the Christian life is because we have this old nature still in us and our flesh, and we have the devil, and we have the world that we're combating and so forth, and we have these enemies within us, and we have these counter counterproductive um, information coming at us from all over the place, okay? Uh, how many of you have ever seen uh, this on a bumper sticker or t-shirt. I am the captain of my fate. Ever seen that? I have. What does that mean? That means I'm in charge, right? Whatever happens to me, I'm going to be, you know, the doer of it or whatever, but that's not what a minister is. A minister, again, has subordinated himself to the will of another. And again, my question to you is this, do you see that? Do you understand that? Are you doing that? The Apostle Paul certainly did understand and see and did do that, and we're the beneficiaries of it, are we not? Because we, he wrote a lot of uh, letters that we call the New Testament. The majority of it, of course, was written by the Apostle Paul. Things that he saw, he told us about. Some of those things that he saw, he was not allowed to to tell us about. We'll find out when we get to heaven. But that's not the end of our purpose, to be a minister, to subordinate ourselves underneath the, the commands of another and accomplish those things. But notice what he says. He goes on and he says, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of those things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. All right, so it's kind of a twofold purpose here to be a minister, to subordinate underneath the superior, do and accomplish those commands. And then he says, a witness. If you're in the habit of writing in your margin of your Bible or someplace, maybe you're taking notes right now, underli or underline witness in someplace close by, put the, this phrase down. It literally means when it comes to being a witness, it literally means one who remembers. How many of you have ever, well, you've ever been asked, 
how did you get saved? How many of you remember that? You remember when you got saved? Three of you do. Okay. You remember it, right? Whether you, whether you think about it every day or not. Uh, one of those classes that I had to take when I was a preacher boy uh, was personal evangelism. First thing, first assignment, straight out of the chute was come back with your personal salvation testimony written down. Instructor went on and he said, I want to know when, I want to know, and that means, you know, if you can, if you had it marked down, I mean, I know some guys that had it marked in their Bible, the day and the month and the year and the person and the place and, and all of that. Okay. At that time I didn't, I had to call my mom and say, when did I get saved? She said, well, don't you remember? Yeah, sort of. I remember, you know, Pastor Norris's office at Harmony and Sumter and you know, that, and I, it was in the summertime because we were out of school. Um, I don't remember the year. I don't remember the month. I didn't remember the day. And she told me. So I wrote it down because it's part of the assignment. Are you aware of the fact, do you understand that you have a very unique occurrence, I'll say, in your life that nobody else has? Something happened to you. Yeah, it might be. There's a whole bunch of people got saved, right? There's a whole bunch of people that have been saved since, you know, even this year and so forth and so on. But when we get to heaven, how many people are going to be there? There's going to be millions of people there. So they go through the same kind of similar process, but it's all different. And your personal salvation testimony is unique to you. My encouragement to you would be to remember and write it down. Because anytime you ask somebody or somebody asks you, well, do you tell me, when did you become a Christian? You know, don't, um, don't answer, well, I've been a Christian all my life. No, that's not true, right? I've been a Christian since I was born. No, that's not true, right? When did you get saved? Do you remember that? Are you willing to be a witness to somebody else who's concerned about their salvation, whether they're going to go to heaven or not, whether, you know, there's, okay, why is there, why am I here? What's the purpose of life? A couple of days ago, you know what a couple of days ago was? What day it was? It was June the 25th. You know what they call that? It's National Leon Day. Did you know that? It's National Leon Day. Jonathan sent me a text a couple years ago on that particular day, 625, whenever it was. He goes, Happy Leon Day. Who's Leon? I didn't know. He goes, Dad, it's six months to the day till Christmas. It's Noel backwards. Oh, Eureka. I saw, I see. Okay, I got it. Okay. But Leon Day, it's kind of unique, kind of an interesting way of um, now we're two days into it. So your shopping days, you've lost two shopping days till Christmas, right? Why is that important? It's kind of unique. It's kind of an interesting way to remember, okay, Christmas is coming. But when you think about your salvation and your testimony and when you got saved, it's, and, and I hope you remember that, and maybe you haven't written it down. Maybe you'll take the challenge and you'll write it down, your personal salvation testimony of the day, the place, the person, the events leading up to it, and that kind of thing, and maybe some things afterward since you've been saved, how the Lord's worked in your heart and life and used you and that purpose and so forth that we're talking about. But your salvation testimony is a unique way to remember 
not only that you got saved, but what else? What else? Why did you get saved? Who saved you? I've had people come to me, you know, they give their personal salvation testimony and they'll point to me and say, Pastor Arbuckle came by my house and he saved me. I'm going, no, I did not. I understand what you're saying. I got that, but it wasn't me, okay? I could die a thousand times for your sin and never pay a dime of it. It wouldn't make any difference. But I understand what people are saying, but who died for you? Jesus did. Why did he do it? Because of his love for you. If you had not been saved, where would you be on your way headed now? You're not going to heaven. Heaven is not going to be your home. I'm sorry. I didn't matter how good you are, how good your family is, and all that kind of thing. If you die lost today, hell is going to be where you're going to be for all eternity. But when it comes to remembering your salvation, write it down. That will help you be a witness, be one who remembers. Now, it's interesting that Jesus mentions this to make thee a minister and a witness both. Now, notice this. Things which thou hast seen. Since you've been saved, have you seen God work in your life? Has God worked in your heart? Are you different today, two days after Leon Day, than you were when you first got saved? I hope the answer to that question is, uh-huh, I sure am. Okay, what's different? I know one thing's different about Wyatt. Wyatt's taller than when he got saved, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely, because he was shorter than he is right now. All right, we've all gotten older, right? He's 14 today. He was younger than that when he got saved. How old were you when you got saved? Do you remember what God has done in that time span? Have you seen God do something in your life and in your heart? But this particular phrase, one who remembers as a witness, is used in the New Testament to designate. Now catch this because it's very unique. It's used in the New Testament to designate those who announce the facts of the gospel. What are the facts of the gospel? Do you remember? Do you know them? Have you seen them? Have you memorized them? Are you proclaiming them? Are you a witness? Do you remember those things? What is the gospel? The gospel in a nutshell is Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and raised again. And you could add a third point to it and coming again real soon. That's the gospel. Now, as a witness, are you announcing the facts of the gospel? to tell its tidings. Hey, it is good news. That's what the, the euangelion means, gospel. It is good news. What is that? Do you remember? Do you remember what it meant to you when you got saved, when you heard the fact that you did not any longer have to bear the burden and the penalty of your sin? If you would put your faith and your trust in what Jesus Christ did on the cross, you could be saved. You're the penalty is cleared out. Your sin debt is paid for. Heaven becomes your home. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside you, and your purpose, I hope, becomes clear. What God wants to do for you and with you and through you and in you. Amen. Help us to see our purpose. God did not make a mistake when he put you on this planet, however long ago it was. He's not done with you. I've had some older saints. And I'm, I'm getting into that category. I'm fighting against it as much as I can. But there's only one alternative to growing old. Well, actually two. And either way, I'm going to be in heaven, right? 
if I don't grow older, what does that mean? I stopped, I stopped living, possibly, at the end of my life, right? Or what's the other option? Is there another option? Yes, there is. The rapture. And I'm not going to get a day older after that. Either way, I'm not going to get a day older, right? But regardless of how long you live, how much longer you live, you still have a purpose. Some older saints have told me before, you know, they were involved in church and so forth and so on. And, and for years, they taught this class or did this, sang in this choir or played this instrument or did whatever they did and so forth. But now they get to a point where they say, well, let the old, younger people do it because I'm tired. I'm going to sit back. Wait a minute. Hang on just a second. Is God done with you yet? The answer to the question is no. Now, maybe you would adjust, okay? Maybe you can't, you know, as a, um, when <clears throat> a lot of guys get into the ministry, first get into the ministry there because they're young, you know, they're all, they're full of spit and vinegar and activity and vitality and all this other stuff. And they become youth pastors. And I've been there, done that. All right. But there comes a time when you get older, you look at teenagers and you still love them. You still want to have an, uh, um, an impact in their lives. But getting down on the carpet and wrestling with them, no, thank you. Getting down, you know, going and, and, and playing pickup football or basketball or whatever, stuff like that. I can't run, can't jump anymore, so I just referee, you know. But even that, okay, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe the Lord is changing the purpose that he's got for my life because I like teenagers. I used to be one and stuff. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't have, my body doesn't, it doesn't do what it used to do. So let somebody else do that, and I'll let them do that. Maybe your purpose changes, but regardless of your age, God still has a purpose. He still has a plan. You can still be a minister. You can still subordinate yourself to your superior and accomplish his commands regardless of your age. You can still be a witness, one who remembers what God did and maybe it is that part of your purpose as an older, older Christian is to, and Paul even mentions this to Timothy in one of his letters to Timothy. He talks about the aged women. You know who those are? It's people, it's ladies older than you are. Right, ladies? The aged women doing what? Teaching the younger women. Okay, maybe it is that part of your purpose as an older Christian is to, uh, you, you know, big thing in, in business schools and different things and even corporate America years ago, maybe even still today, is to be a mentor, be a mentor to somebody. You know what that is? How many of you ever had one? I never did. I mean, I, I, I got advice from men that I knew in the ministry and I trusted and, and uh was encouraged by and so forth, but I, I was never, they didn't have anybody that took me under their wing and said, okay, Don, here's how we do what we do. But that's important. That might be your purpose as you're getting older is to look at a younger Christian. Maybe it is one of these teenagers that you would spend time with. Okay. Because you, you oh, let's ask that question. Do you remember when you were a teenager? How long ago was it? No, don't answer the question. I'd rather not. Yeah, it's been a while. <clears throat> okay, um, and 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 um, it's been about forty years ago since I quit being a Christian or quit, quit being a Christian. No, quit being a teenager. Okay, but that brings a okay slip of the tongue. It was not. It was not a coincidence, right? Um, do some people, the older they get. quit being Christians? Do they step away from their purpose? Do they step away from wanting to see God do things in their lives? Do they step away from subordinating themselves to their superior and wanting to accomplish his commands for, for his honor and his glory? Unfortunately, the answer to that question is probably more common than we would realize is yes. 
But what's your purpose? You have a purpose. You're still here. Jesus hasn't come back yet. He could come back before 1105, which is just a couple minutes from now. But if he doesn't, do you want to see him fulfill the purpose that you have, that he has for you? Do you want to see that? You want to see, do do you think about how sad it would be to live your life as a Christian, however many decades, however many years, and look back on it as you get closer to the end of your life, or maybe even on your deathbed, and recount what God might have done. You never saw him do anything because you didn't minister or witness. Wouldn't that be sad? Sure, it would be sad. Certainly, heaven's still your home. But this particular phrase here, as Jesus is speaking to Paul, he says, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, past tense, and of those things which those things in the which I will appear unto thee, okay? God's not done with us yet. I've already mentioned that. God's still going to do stuff. Are you looking forward to what God might do? Are you excited about it? Romans chapter 15, let me turn there real quickly. I'll not have you turn there for time unless you want to. But verse number four says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, that's way back then, right? Were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Part of your purpose as an older Christian might be, whether it's mentoring or just come alongside one of these teenagers or some other Christian or somebody that's not saved yet and, and telling them, You know, I I see where you are in your life. I've been there. I've done that. Let me give you some advice. Unsolicited or not, right? And and let let me just tell you what God did for me. That's part of your purpose, to minister and to witness for the Lord. My hope and my prayer for myself personally, and I've seen this, I've watched God do it, and I'm looking forward to what God is going to do. I was thinking just recently about transition from one ministry to another. It's happened in my lifetime twice now. And I look back on it, and the only thing I can do is rejoice that I got to see God use me. It's not that God can't use us, right? Because we know God can. What can God do? What can God do? God can do anything. The amazing thing is that he chooses to use us, isn't it? Because I know myself pretty well. I know myself better than anybody here. And what amazes me is that God still shows me his mercy and his grace and has used me to impact the others. That's part of our purpose. I see that. It's part of your purpose. Do you see that? And are you doing that? Let's go a little further because... We want to see God's purpose for our lives. We want to see God's protection as well. Acts chapter 26, notice verse 17. Jesus says, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. That's an interesting verse right there. God is sending Paul to a group of people. And by this time in Paul's ministry, What has happened to Paul? Paul's been imprisoned. Paul's been beaten. Paul's been stoned and left for dead. He's been uh, maligned and harassed and lied about 
and you name it. All kinds of things have happened to Paul, but what did God do? He delivered Paul out of all of these things. Now answer this question for me. Are there people that you come in contact with that God has brought you in contact with to witness and to minister to that are somewhat, well, they're kind of like, and you've heard me say this before, they're kind of like puffer fish or porcupines. You know what I'm talking about? You know, people that live like porcupines? Never known anybody like that? You know how a porcupine protects itself? What do they do? Because their quills will lay flat. But when they feel threatened or angry, what happens to their quills? Now, they can't shoot them, okay? But they got a tail on them that, that, that will, yeah, it, it'll reach around and it'll bite you. And, and one of the ways that they protect themselves when they're threatened or angry or whatever is they puff those quills out and guess which way they go? They go backwards. I've known people like that. They live their lives backwards and they're looking to stick anybody and everybody that gets in their way. Ever come across somebody like that? They're again, like puffer fish, you know, you know what I'm talking about? They get a little upset and they go, they bow up. You've seen it, right? I was talking to uh, a retired uh, lieutenant out of one of the local uh, sheriff's offices here just yesterday. And uh, he is now, uh, he's working part-time to transport um, um, prisoners and different stuff like that. And, and he was telling us, and he's a big guy. He's probably 6'3", and uh, he's bigger than I am. And um, he, he said, you know, I come in contact with people all the time, and they're kind of going, you're not going to take me to jail. You, you know what? You, you've seen that, right? You know, people kind of bow up, you know? They make themselves look bigger than they really are. And uh, this, this guy, again, he's a big fella, okay? And I'm thinking, how dumb would that be? No, you're not taking me to jail. And, and I said, well, how do you handle that? He said, I just tell them, you know, they got those sandwiches down at Wendy's or Hardee's or whatever it is. It's a double baconator with cheese. I know where you guys are going for lunch right after this, right? It's a heart attack on a plate. Do you have any idea how many calories are in one of those? I don't care. I'm not going to get one. My, because I love my wife and she loves me, and we'll go eat celery or something. <laughs> but he said, I can take them and I can put them on the ground and I can put them in cuffs. And I can put them in the back of my trunk of my car if I wanted to. He said, but I found out a long time ago that food will get people to do a lot of things. I was like, that's not a bad idea. You know, that sensitivity training we hear about the police needing to go through, maybe it needs to incorporate, you know, double baconators. You got these really hardened criminals you just, you know, that carrot on a stick, so to speak. But what is, he, what is he saying? He's talking about difficult people. Where is Jesus sending Paul to deal with difficult people? I was talking to a fellow yesterday as well, and he was saying, he was talking about pastors that he's had and different things like that. And he said, this pastor used to say all the time, and I've said it before, you've heard me say it. It's kind of a joke amongst ministers, amongst pastors. The ministry would be great if it weren't for people. Well, I'm sorry to have to tell you there, but, um, you, you know, um, you have no ministry if you don't have people. So you need to have you need to deal be able to deal with the difficult people, the prickly, porcupine, puffer fish kind of people, right? And what does Jesus say? He says, delivering thee from these people. 
Have you ever seen God deliver you at all? You ever seen that happen? I want you to hold your fingers there, and I want to go to Psalm 18 to begin with. Psalm 18, because there's some verses that I'm, I want us to, to consider this morning and to kind of flesh this out. <laughs> Psalm 18. Notice verse 1. Psalm 18. Now, notice the heading. Do you have the heading that says to the chief musician, a Psalm of David? And you go down through here, and it says the... Um, who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord, what, delivered him from the hand of all his enemies? Is that a good verse to think about when you're thinking about God's deliverance? Notice this. He says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my what? Deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler, that's basically just a small round shield that uh, soldiers wore on, you know, their non-dominant hand, so to speak, generally their left hand uh, to, to ward off um, swords, sword strikes and so forth. He says, my buckler, the horn of my salvation, my high tower, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Look down at verse 17, Psalm 18, 17 says, he delivered me from my strong enemy, from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also unto a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Turn to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Verse 1. Psalm 34, 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. My praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me. And he did what? Delivered me from all my fears. Have you ever been afraid? Not knowing, you know, and what, what are people generally afraid of these days? is the unknown, right? We don't know what's going to happen. We're dealing with, you know, with Jonathan and Madison and, and so forth. Okay, maybe it is that, you, you know, you think about people on our prayer list. They're dealing with things. They're looking at things. They're looking at procedures and surgeries and whatever it is. They need to make a decision, and they don't know what's the best decision. Should we? Should we not? Well, what does it say there? He says in verse 17 of Psalm 34, I'm sorry, let's, I'm still reading down through. I sought the Lord, verse number four. He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked, looked at, unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and he saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and do, does what? delivers them all right skip down to verse 17 he says the righteous cry psalm 34 17 says the righteous cry and the lord heareth them and delivereth them out of all their troubles the lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart save as such as of a contrite spirit one more psalm psalm 56 turn there psalm 56 and verse 9 says, when I cry unto thee, have you ever done that? Have you ever cried unto the Lord? You know what we're talking about? What is that? That's an earnest, fervent request that comes out of our lips at the time of need, the time of trouble, time of fear, when things look to overwhelm us, and what do we do? Maybe we just say two words, Lord, help. He goes on, let's see, where are we? Psalm 56, 9. When I cried unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for, the, for God is for me. In God shall I praise his word. In the Lord shall I praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praise. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. 
Wilt thou not deliver my feet from falling that I may walk before God <coughs> in the light of, my, of the living? Let's go back to Psalm 26 or Acts 26. I'm sorry. We're in Psalms. All of those verses, what do they talk about? They talk about God's deliverance. Have you ever seen God do that? Have you ever seen him deliver you out of whatever trouble, whatever fear from whatever person? Have you ever seen that happen? I hope so. If not, I hope you'll, you'll begin to have your, the eyes of your heart, the eyes of your understanding open because God is still working. God is still protecting and so forth. He did that to the apostle Paul. There may be people that you need to come in contact with that God is going to, to, to send you to, to be a testimony, be a witness and be a minister to who, when you start that conversation, when you start that relationship, this kind of like, man, oh man, what did I get myself into? I don't, I don't see how this is going to work out. I know they're lost. I know they're mad. I know they're angry. I know they're whatever. They're antagonistic. They don't necessarily want to hear what I have to say, but I know the best thing for them and the purpose that God has for me is to be a minister and a witness to tell them and remember and let them know how God changed my life. And yeah, they might be tough. What, what do you do? What did Paul do? Did he just give up at the first sign of trouble? No, he didn't. And God protected him through that. And I want to see, and I hope we all want to see God's protection, not only of us personally and our families and the circumstances we find ourselves, but Harborside Baptist Church and, and, and Christians in to the future. How about this? Let's go to Acts 26, 18. He says to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that thou may receive, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. What else does Paul or God, Jesus tell Paul and that we want to see, we hope to see, we hope to see, and I want God to see, and we need help to see God's plan. What is God's plan? It hasn't changed. It's the same as it was way back when. What is it? that people come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that they be converted, that they be turned, that that's a, 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 a term of, that's a, a, the same word that we get the word repentance from. That's what that is. How many of you seen any, have ever seen anybody's life turn around after they got saved? Ever seen that? Did your life turn around when you got saved? I would hope it did, right? Certainly. Well, I want to take you to one more passage of scripture. Turn to Colossians chapter one. There's another group of believers, a church, group of churches actually in Colossae that Paul is writing to. Notice what he says in Colossians 1, verse number 9. Colossians 1, 9 says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Have you did you notice that in Ephesians? He said similar kind of thing. Paul was always praying for the believers in the churches that he founded and, and, and all those people. It says to be... Uh, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk, walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Go back to 
Acts 26. Do you notice the similarity between verse 18 and, and what Jesus is telling Paul his plan is and what Paul wrote to the Colossians? The fact that they were turned, their eyes were opened, just like in Ephesians, that they could see, we need to pray that people would see their need of salvation. How many of you know somebody that is unsaved, that is lost this morning? We all do. What do we want to see? We want to see the eyes of their understanding, the eyes of their heart open, that they might see what? That they might see their desperate need of salvation before it's eternally too late. That they might and, and that they might know and come to know Jesus Christ is their personal savior. And how is that going to happen? It's going to happen more probably, more quickly, perhaps, even if we see their need. We fulfill the purpose that God has for us to do what? To subordinate ourselves to his will, to go to those people, even though they may be prickly, even though they may be hard to deal with, they still need to know. And we remind them because we remember what God did for us when he saved us and how he's done in all of our lives, the delivering and protecting and, 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 and everything of our lives. That they might be turned from darkness to the light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? Do you remember when you received that? Do you remember that? And do you also remember and are you, do you realize that you have something that is still waiting? What is it? He says here, an inheritance. When are we going to get it? When are we going to see it? Could be before 1130, which is about five minutes from now. When the Lord comes back, where are we going to be? Where are we going to spend eternity? Why did that happen? How did it happen? Do you remember those things? Do you know these things? Did you see that when it happened to you? Do you want to see these things in the lives of others? Do you want them to understand their purpose? Do you want them to see what God's plan is for them? I hope so. That's the reason Paul was sent. That's the reason why we're still here. We have the same purpose to minister and to witness to those that we come in contact with for God's honor and God's glory. So that one of these days, what are we going to be able to do? We're going to be able to, when I'm sure there's, there's going to be probably thousands upon thousands of people that came in contact with Paul and were saved. You know, how many of you, um, some, when you got saved, somebody, read you and explained to you the Romans road? How many of you? Some of you? How many of you remember Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? Was that read to you before you got saved? Who wrote that? Who wrote Romans? Who wrote Ephesians? Paul did. Absolutely. Since you've been saved, has this mind been in you, which was also in Christ Jesus? Who wrote that? Paul did. There are going to be thousands and thousands of people in heaven someday because Paul, his eyes were open that he began to see God's purpose, God's plan, and he fulfilled it. My question to you is this. Do you understand what God's purpose is? Do you understand what God's plan is? Do you see that? And are you following like we sang this morning? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to look into your word. And we would pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes that we might see even more than we've seen from your word, even more than we see 
in our daily lives about your plan and your purpose. Help us not to take your protection for granted. Help us to fulfill it. That plan and that purpose that you have for our lives that others may see and the eyes of their hearts, the eyes of their understanding would be open and they might be snatched from the power of Satan and placed into the kingdom of your dear son. 